We have a lot of conversations on this show about alternative cosmologies, about different ways of looking at mainstream narratives. So we thought it would be a really good idea to bring somebody on the show who spends all of their time representing the mainstream perspectives and pick his brain about the narrative and really get the story from the horse's mouth. So today we have Ethan Siegel from Forbes magazine. He has a very, probably the most popular blog on standard cosmology um, called It Starts, It All Starts with the Bang? It Starts with the Bang? It Starts with the Bang. And Ethan is really a great mind at unpacking all the developments that have happened in the past 50, 100 years in standard cosmology. So I feel like I have a much better grip on the standard narrative after speaking with him. We did have a few really interesting fractures fall out, and I'm curious what you guys think about those, um, especially concerning the Hubble tension, you know, the, the differences in the way inflation is measured, uh, considering the production of heavy elements that are in some of these stars, like Shabelsky's star. There's some interesting points that uh, hopefully we were able to give Ethan something to think about as well. If you like what we do, support us on Patreon. We are patreon.com slash demystify You can donate a very small amount every month and you will do a great job of keeping this program afloat and helping us grow. If you've already done that, the best thing that you can do is just share it with a friend. Tell them about this new science podcast that you found. Yeah, and guys, get in the comments section and tell us how stupid we're being or tell us what you think is a good lead that we should follow up on. Um, really help us steer the ship because we want to be able to get deeper and deeper into these questions and we need your ideas. See you next week. The scientific revolution starts now. When I was 18 years old, someone said to me, it was a math professor, he said to me something that uh, resonated with me. It was that it was my differential equations professor. And he said, most of the differential equations that exist cannot be solved. And then he said, and most of the differential equations that can be solved cannot be solved by you. <laughs> and I thought this was kind of brilliant because um, it sort of said like, hey, even you really smart people who've learned a lot and know a lot, um, you don't know all there is to know about this topic. And even after you take this course, you're not going to know everything there is to know about this topic. And so for me, uh, with a PhD, having done postdoctoral work, having been a professor for, I think I was a professor for eight years, uh, and now I do science communication for full, full time, and I've been doing it, uh, you know, part time to full time, all told for almost 15 years now. Um, Yes, I'm happy to tell stories of what what expert level thing do I know that probably only a few thousand people in the world know, but that everyone would be interested in. Um, and so I think when you talk about demystifying science, uh, you know, I, I treat people that I talk to like they're Martians, which is to say, I treat them like they'd be intelligent, but that they have no experience with the things we do. And so if I can take something that is known, that we know, that I know, and make it so that everyone else knows it too, I think that's that's a positive thing to bring. Yeah, and, and that must have, you've explored so many different topics over the years as well. It seems like you've really had a chance to, you know, they say you don't really know something until you teach it. And uh it's a pretty cool platform that you've been able to experience. You must have uh, had the opportunity to talk to hundreds of different scientists in these fields and really get an insight. Oh, yeah. Inside. No, I mean, some of the most valuable things I do uh, are uh, I go to conferences. I speak with people cutting edge in the field. Uh, when I do my podcast, uh, I've switched. I made the switch about four years ago to exclusively bring early career people in the mm -hmm. field onto my podcast. Uh, and I do that because that's, look, I, I started graduate school in 2001. I graduated in 2006. That was already 16 years ago. Um, 
things advance. We learn new things, things change. And so when I'm looking at not just my area of expertise, but many adjacent fields and subfields of astronomy, physics, astrophysics, cosmology, um, there's a huge opportunity for me to learn out there. And you're right, uh, the act of learning what's out there and then breaking it down into terms that someone who is much less of an expert for me can still comprehend it and understand it and walk away confident that they've understood what I'm talking about, not falsely confident, but truly confident. Um, that's a very positive thing to bring. What are some of the biggest changes you've seen since you were in grad school in the fields that you're studying? I mean, I would say some of the biggest changes that I've seen have come in areas of like exoplanet sciences. When I started graduate school, we knew of between one and 200 exoplanets. And less than a year ago, we passed the 5,000 exoplanet mark. Um, we know um, so much more about dark energy and the origin of the universe versus from when I started graduate school. Dark energy was only first revealed to us in 1998. So when I started grad school in 2001, there were a lot of people who didn't even think that this was going to be robust. They thought that this was maybe an observational problem that would go away with more data. And now it's so it's on such firm footing that if you took all of the data that we've collected up until 2001, if you said, okay, we had cosmic microwave background data, we had supernova data, and you threw that all away, we would still have an overwhelming case for dark energy. Mm. Um, another huge thing, uh, gravitational waves. Do they exist? Were they detectable? This is something we didn't know when I was in graduate school. Since our first detection in 2015, uh, this is an exploding area of research. We, we know black holes exist and they exist with these masses that we never knew they had and they in spiral and merge together. And neutron stars and neutron stars merge together. And that, by the way, another fun thing we learned from uh, those observations, that's where most of the heaviest elements in the universe come from. If you had asked me when I was in graduate school, I would have told you they were in supernovas, that supernova explosions gave rise to the heaviest elements in the universe. And now we know that supernovas are responsible for many of the elements in the universe, you, up to about zirconium, which is element 40. But that's only 40, and the periodic table goes up much higher than that. Uh, lead is the heaviest stable element. That's element 82. Many of the very heaviest elements, platinum, tungsten, gold, um, all of the radioactive elements, their overwhelming means of production are in these kilonova events, neutron star, neutron star mergers, not supernova. We didn't know that as well. What do you um, make about these reports of heavy elements, like very transient heavy elements, uh, being seen in some distant stars. Like, are you familiar with uh, Shabilsky's star? Przybilsky's star, right? Or no? I mean, that's how it's spelled, yeah. I think it's pronounced Shabilsky. Really? Yeah. All right. At least according well, to my tell, friend. Tell me about them, because what I am familiar <sighs> yeah. with is in these, uh, in the outskirts of exactly, yeah. uh, recently uh, either dredged up material or recently uh, blown off material, you can find heavy, unstable elements like plutonium and curium, right? These transuranic elements that have long but not excessively long lifetimes. Um, you can find traces of them in in these environments. What what specifically are Shibalesti, uh however you say <laughs> stars? Yeah, it's really strange. There's these there's a uh, few elements. The strontium, holmium, niobium, scandium, yttrium, cesium, neo. Uh, neodymium. neodymium. My Chrysodium. magnets are made out of that. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. a couple of them Thorium. that only last like 15 minutes, which is Ytterbium, really weird. Uranium, uranium. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just so was basically, curious. like all, the lanthanides and the exotic elements are thought to be highly overabundant in the star, and it also okay. contains a lot of short-lived elements. Uh, Mericium, curium, like all of the like the weird, the, the weird ones yeah, that yeah, have been the, synthesized the on Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so I would assume that these are stars in the uh, what we call the AGB phase, the asymptotic giant branch phase. I'm not particularly sure because I haven't heard of this before. But in general, what happens is when you have a star that's very evolved, uh, which means it's sort of like that onion-like layer where different layers of the star are fusing different elements, uh, you get two types of phenomena inside that happen simultaneously. One of them is with all of the fusion that goes on, you get reactions that produce free neutrons. Mm. And those neutrons can get absorbed by the surrounding nucleus, surrounding nuclei, which will make them heavier. And as they become heavier, uh, they will beta decay. They will radioactively decay and they will move up an element in the periodic table. It's generally difficult to make elements heavier than uh, lead and bismuth by that, but all those heavy, stable elements in there. Um, so the lanthanides, but not the actinides, um, that's, where, that's where those are generally made in these evolved stars. Um, but you also get uh, these dredge up phenomena mm. where the stars, they're not perfectly stratified in these different layers. Material from the core will sort of convect up and cooler material will sink down, the denser mm. material will sink down towards the center. And so you get these dredge ups combined with neutron bombardment and that can create some of those exotic elements for you. Interesting. Did you see anything uh, while you were looking about um, the I mean, the, hypothetical the, uh, origins? I think the uh, Ethan's point about the the strangeness of the production is one of the hypotheses, and then the other one is that it's it's a SETI candidate, basically, where it's Whoa. it could be. Uh, <laughs> Didn't expect that. I mean, honestly, anytime that you find a weird abundance of elements in outer space, people are going to think you know advanced civilization, mm -hmm. and so the well, presence. Well, I mean, of that's the, that's always the thing, right? You can always say, right, right. We it's either this physical thing that we are working to understand and we have, or aliens, right? <laughs> or aliens. You can always, or aliens, anything. Like, yeah. what do you think this is? Well, it's dust or aliens. And what's this? Well, it's an X-ray binary or aliens. What's this? It's a pulsar or aliens, right? I mean, I think um, that that speaks to kind of one of the difficulties of astronomy, which is that we're looking at stuff that's so far away and it is so based upon our interpretations of it that it's pretty easy to, to have a, a lot of uncertainty about our conclusions. And if we have well, the uncertainty about our conclusions, well, I think, because I think it's you so just mean away. like it's because we can't put it in a lab, basically. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, like you worked in microbiology, right? And it's easy because you can make like a model system in the lab and poke at it. And but even inside of microbiology, you at some point come to realize that you're like, okay, so we have a couple of model organisms, and those model organisms have books written about them for how you're going to do their genetics and stuff like that. But if you were to go out into the world and try to do microbiology on the myriad of uncultural species, you're going to really quickly run into the fact that you don't know as much as you think you do. No, and this is this is part of why um, we are really, really hesitant in astronomy to base a strong conclusion on one object, even one class of objects, or one line of evidence alone. We generally are, um, you know, I'll say even though astronomers and astrophysicists come from all across the political spectrum, the consensus position in astronomy and astrophysics is always very conservative in the sense that um, we are harsh critics of ideas. When someone has a hypothesis for how something is working, uh, we generally, if it's not the null hypothesis, where the null hypothesis is, we're only going to rely on well-established physical phenomena to explain what we see. And we're gonna make predictions for, okay, we know this, we know this, we know this, what do we expect? If we see that, we're pretty confident that's good. If we see something different, some people are gonna propose new effects, new physics, new phenomena, new the new presence of something, new interplay of something. Other people, are going to try and poke holes in that as strong as they can. They're gonna try and knock it down as hard as they can because there are always 
you know, we make a model of something. We try and model what are the important physical effects happening in this system. And by b- because we're trying to do that, we have to simplify. We have to say, okay, I think heat is important. I think uh, molecular co- or I think particle collisions are important. I think nuclear physics is important. I think radiation pressure is important, right? But we'll also say then, oh, but I think I think I can ignore gravity, or I think I can ignore right. You'll say, here's what I think is important to include in the model. Here's what I think is it can safely be ignored. And sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we ignore things that you have to fold back into the model. And we tried to ignore it because it makes things really hard to calculate or predict. But that's part of why you have this interplay between theory and observation. Just like in a laboratory science, you have this interplay between theory and experiment, theory and measurement. You have measurement in astronomy, but the big difference is you only have one laboratory and you don't get to control the experiments. The laboratory is the universe. It's out there. You can observe it. You can observe the right systems. You can find the right systems, but it's important to check, okay, if I see one class of system that's doing this one thing, that's interesting. And if I have a physical explanation for it that I think is good, then I should find another system, another class of systems where that same physical effect is going to play a role. And I'm going to see if I can observe that physical effect in that system too. And only if you can start doing that, will people in the field start believing this is actually behind what we see. It's why we're really lucky that we saw, you know, tens of black hole, black hole mergers before we saw our first neutron star, neutron star merger. If we had only seen that kilonova event that we saw in 2017, if that was our first gravitational wave event, we would have been a lot less certain of what was going on than you know if we had had a couple of years of seeing black hole, black hole mergers prior to that. Mm. Oh, did, did you have something about that? I want to go back to something from earlier. I also want to go back to sleep. <laughs> you first. Yeah, you 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 mentioned exoplanets being one of the most exciting things uh, in Reese mm-hmm. that have changed so much, and I also think they're really exciting. Do you think that they are teaching us about the evolution of our own planet? You know, this is this is one of the big connections that we hope to be someday able to make because one of the things we still don't know is how common is an Earth-like planet, and in fact. What is it about a planet that makes it Earth-like? What do we what do we mean when we say Earth-like? If if you had said Earth-like back in the early 1990s, before we had discovered our first exoplanet, you would have said, oh, Earth-like means you're rocky and in the inner part of your solar system, you have a thin atmosphere, you have liquid water on your surface, and you probably have life. That's Earth-like. Today, I don't know if that's a good definition for Earth-like because we know that planets, um, Earth is pretty big, but you can be about twice as massive as Earth uh, and maybe 25 or 30% larger in diameter than Earth and still be rocky and have a thin atmosphere. But are those types of planets more common than the last massive Earth-Venus type planets? What about super Earth planets? Are they actually Earth-like or are they more Neptune-like with a thick hydrogen and helium envelope around them? Um, We're still trying to answer that question. Um, what um, What about where it orbits? What kind of star it orbits? Do you have to orbit a star like our sun? It turns out you probably have heard that the sun is a typical star. But if I took all the stars in the universe and counted them, I would find that the sun is bigger, brighter, and more massive than 95% of the stars in the universe. (laughs) A typical star, most of the stars in the universe are low mass, faint, dim, red dwarf stars. Hmm. I didn't know that. If a planet orbits those stars, it's likely to be tidally locked, like the moon is tidally locked to Earth, where one side always faces its parent star in orbit, and one side always faces away from it. 
if those are common and those are the most common things that's out there, should we maybe be looking for those planets to have life on them rather than an Earth-like planet? Are we actually the most conducive planet for life to arise on it? I think about things like, I think about life like I think about lottery tickets. We won the cosmic lottery in coming into existence, right? That I count that as a win. You exist, like I exist. Specifically? I mean, I, I would say us on Earth as Earthlings <laughs> specifically, we won the cosmic lottery. You as an individual, uh, you've won many cosmic lotteries <laughs> to been to to get here. Three point eight billion uh, you, you years. You won worth a cosmic of lottery. You won a biological lottery. You won you won a lot of lotteries for you to come into existence. But um, that said. There's this problem with a lottery because we're talking about what are the odds that life arose and it survived and thrived in an unbroken streak for billions of years and it complexified and diversified and gave rise to a technologically advanced civilization, right? All of these things, we won the lottery. Our planet, planet Earth, won the lottery. But what does that mean? The problem is we are the only example we know of out of the more than 5,000 planets we know of where there is life here. We do not know of any other planet that has any biological activity on it yet. Mm. So right now we are in this weird position where we know we won the lottery, but we don't know what the odds are of winning any prize at all, including the prize we won. And we don't know what the other prizes are in this lottery. Did we even win the grand prize? Or is there a grander prize out there Whoa. that some planet <laughs> Super life. Has, has better, more intelligent, more complex life and better conditions for it than we do? Um, this is a big question. These are some of the biggest questions that... We don't have answers to yet, but at least we know to ask those questions now. And I'm hopeful that 21st century science will bring us collectively, us as a species, um, more clarity on some of those answers. I'm very optimistic that we will start finding other planets, maybe even other worlds within our own solar system, but certainly out there among the exoplanets that have life on them that are inhabited, that maybe have a saturated planet where life has saturated its biosphere like it has here on Earth. Uh, maybe if we're lucky, we'll even find evidence of complex differentiated life, maybe even intelligent or technologically advanced life. But the only way we know is by looking. So I hope we continue to look and I hope that as our technology develops and we become more capable of discovering what might be out there that we continue to invest in it. And so with 5,000 exoplanets and they're orbiting, uh, they, the only ones that we can really see are the ones that cross in front of another star because they're not really emitting light. And so it's this kind of indirect way of detection. Is there... Well, that's, that's the most successful way of detection. It's not the only one, though. What are the other ones? Well, one of the ways we tell a planet is present and actually the first way we found planets present is by watching a star. Because when stars have planets orbiting them, even if the planet doesn't cross our line of sight to the star, remember the way gravity works is it isn't just planet orbit around stars, it's planets and stars orbit around their common center of mass. So as this star moves in the presence of a planet, there will be moments where it moves towards you and away from you and towards you and away from you. And that means as it moves towards you, the light gets blue shifted and it moves away from you, the light gets red shifted. And if your data is good enough and they were able to actually use this technique to discover just earlier, a uh, couple weeks ago, the closest black hole ever found to earth, you can sometimes watch the star move side to side in its orbit as well as the other mass goes around it. Mm. So. That is known as either the stellar wobble or the radial velocity technique. And that has found the second most planets so far. 
we also have techniques known as micro lensing, where if uh, it's not even a planet necessarily in your own star system, but if any mass passes in between your line of sight and a star, uh, that's going to cause the star's light to periodically brighten and dim just once. That'll reveal to you the mass and size of your exoplanet. We also have uh, direct imaging techniques. You know, you said that direct imaging, uh, it's too faint. We're actually working on that. We have better and better coronagraphs. Uh, and that means if we can successfully block out the light from a parent star, you can actually see the individual planets orbiting it. We've been able to detect uh, Jupiter-sized planets at the distance of Saturn and beyond from their parent star. And with um, it's hoped that um, with either a starshade, which is a new type of light blocking technology that would fly some distance away from a spacecraft, or with next generation coronagraphs, uh, we might actually be able to start seeing Earth-sized planets around at Earth-like orbit di orbital distances from their parent stars. And even if you can only get one pixel, Think about how amazing the information you can get from one pixel of an exoplanet is if you observe it over time. You could see if it has cloud cover, how it rotates over its orbital period. And you can see, does it have oceans and continents? Uh, you can see as it changes over the seasons, do, does it have ice caps that grow and shrink? You could see uh, as it goes from season to season, does it have continents that green and brown with the seasons? I'm and suspicious. What would that teach you? I'm suspicious that you could get that from a single pixel because that's kind of the way that we looked at Mars before we had good visual techniques, right? Like the stories that we told of Mars, like the first observers were looking at it. All the way up to the 60s or 70s? I, I, all the way up to the Viking landers, right? Like people were expecting that we were going to find life there that maybe... I think that that was a psychological holdover from looking at Mars and telling stories of it being covered with verdant forests that changed color with the seasons and the shifting of the ice caps. And it was like, it was very much in the popular consciousness that Mars was going to be a living planet. And so I'm very suspicious of being able to tell that from a single pixel, well, especially taking uh, into account our tendency to, to myth make. Well, we want to see things. We want to see life, we right? Like we want to see we want to see potential candidates. And so that's kind you of know, I, this is this is why it's important to have a community of scrupulous scientists <laughs> and not just wolf criers. Mm. Because we do have and have always had wolf criers who see what they want to see and do resort to wishful thinking. And that's why I think this scientific mindset of trying to knock down your hypothesis, of being skeptical of what you see, of requiring independent confirmation, which means independent teams, multiple sets of observations, different data sets, cross checks to make sure things are calibrated correctly. Uh, in the case of exoplanets, whenever you have, by the way, a transit signal, we don't rely on that and say that's a detection. We say that gives you a planetary candidate. Mm. You need to detect the presence of that planet with a second independent method in order to confirm it. So when I say there's 5,000 exoplanets, I mean there are 5,000 confirmed exoplanets. There are more than double that number in terms of total exoplanet candidates. And not all of them have turned out to be confirmed. So one of the things you hope to do with even a single pixel by collecting a enough light over time is to do a spectroscopic analysis of it, where you take that light, you break it up into its individual wavelengths, and you start looking for different atomic and molecular signatures. Do you see carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, oxygen? What other elements are present and in what abundances? And do they change seasonally? So if you see greening and browning of continents and you simultaneously see seasonal fluctuations in the carbon dioxide levels over the planet seasonally, that would be a lot stronger evidence than just having the photometric greening and browning. Yeah, definitely. But the, the, this, the, this is a little bit in the weeds from the original question that I wanted to ask, which was about the, the search for life. It's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. I don't totally know why, but it's like, 
What do you make of the fact that there's 5,000 planets that we've seen and even in observing them, we haven't really been able to tell if there are any signals coming from them. Do you interpret that to be confirmation of our aloneness in a dark and, and quiet universe? Or do you think that we just haven't gotten to the point where we know how to look appropriately? Let me, let me turn that question around a little bit. If I took our solar system and I put our solar system out there, at the same distance that a typical one of these 5,000 exoplanets were at. Would we have been able to detect Earth around it? The answer is no. No, we would not be able with current technology, with all the technology that's flown, to detect an Earth-like planet around a Sun-like star with Earth's orbit around the Sun uh, with, the with the data we have. Um, with the telescopes we have and we've flown for this purpose. Um, if we got lucky and it was very close and we had seen Earth um, and we said, okay, we do have an interesting planet there. Let's say around, like around Alpha Centauri, we had that. Would we be able to detect that Earth has life on it? And the answer is not yet. Mm. No, we don't have the technology to see Proxima B, that planet around Proxima Centauri or planet in the Alpha Centauri system, we don't have the technology to detect the radio signals if they were of the same power that Earth is emitting them. We don't have the technology to see that greening and browning of the continents. We don't we don't have it yet. So it seems uh, like we might I be able to say, detect like some really complex molecules would be like our best bet. We had a, you know, I, I would say if you could do spectroscopy and again, our direct imaging technology uh, is not good enough yet, but our transit technology might be, mm. if it happened to transit the planet, you're going to get some of that solar radiation filtering through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, if in particular, we were looking when the that planet reached uh, the 1980s and everyone was using white rain hairspray. We might have been able to see the signature of chlorofluorocarbons. And that, believe it or not, is actually what people talk about as a excellent techno signature. Mm. That if you have made chlorofluorocarbons and you're putting it in your hair to style it, that is, that is, hey, I bet you there's alien life on that planet. So but they look good too. everyone was using <laughs> yeah. that chemical in their hairspray, you could have uh, you could have said, aha, there it is, intelligent life. Look mm. at them destroying their ozone layer right mm. before our eyes. I wanted to ask you, I've been we've both been reading a lot about this the progression of our understanding of the formation of these super earths. And mm -hmm. wow, we've came across a really interesting paper. Um, Obviously, they're starting to uh, consider that some of the more gassy, icy planets could sp spend time closer to the suns, and that um, there's a few people who have published on the idea that these, some of these super-Earths could be the evolved like cores, essentially, of many Neptunes that, that would arise after that. Have you given any thought to that idea? Through like photo evaporation, yeah, so, right? So I will say, if you take all of the exoplanets we know of where we know the mass of the exoplanet and the radius of the exoplanet. What we see are there are three general categories of planets. And at the border of each of the categories, there are some exceptions. So the lowest mass ones go from as small and low mass as you can be and still self-gravitate together, all the way up to about twice the mass of Earth. And those are what we can call rocky or terrestrial planets. Then you have planets that are Neptune-like, and that includes in our solar system, Neptune, no one wants this to be happening. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries, no worries. We can, yeah, it's all good. We can edit it. Do you mind hanging on for a yeah, second? Yeah, yeah, take your time. What happened? I don't know. You got a call. <laughs> Hello? Question. Oh, it's just a threatening spam call. Oh, Lucky no. Me. <laughs> I'm surprised you still have the handheld phone there. Uh, I have a landline. I have a cell phone too, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I um, 
I have a landline because cell reception at my house is unreliable. I live in the boondocks. Mm, we should probably consider that too. Um, hey, one thing that I wanted to say is that your camera keeps coming in and out of focus. Do you it by sure chance, is. do you have like have, a, a focus uh, lock on it? Say that, I'm sorry, say that again? Do you have some kind of focus lock that you can set on it? I don't know if that's a thing that your camera does. So uh, I have an Opal C1 webcam, which is a 4K webcam, and it is glorious. Uh, when you hook it up to a Mac and I'm running it on a PC, uh, which they do not have software for. Mm. So that is why it keeps going in and out of focus. It's not that big of a deal. No, no, it's fine. I was just wondering. It's cool. Yeah, so going. the yeah. evolution of these many, these many Neptunes or the, right. these hypotheses, so, so, yeah. So this is a thing that can happen on that border between Earth-like planets and Neptune-like planets is when you get right towards that border, uh, you can have planets that either are thick and rocky and their volatiles were blown away because they were close enough at one point or maybe are still close enough to their parent star. Hydrogen, helium, and maybe those other light molecules can be blown away. And if that's the case, you might be able to have what we call a stripped planetary core, like a, a rocky planet with either a thin atmosphere or no atmosphere at all, like a Mercury-like world, uh, that actually is a little bit bigger than those two Earth masses, that is a little bit larger in radius than that 1.2 to 1.3 times the radius of Earth. We believe there are a few of those, but most of them are still very, very close to their parent star. Uh, most of the ones that we see that are further away, and we know planets migrate, but we don't know by how much or how often they do. We don't even know why our solar system looks the way it does. One of the leading ideas as to why our solar system has these tiny inner rocky planets and then larger gas dominated planets outside is not only that, oh yeah, we think the gas giants migrated over time in and out. We think that, yeah, we probably formed larger planets in the inner part of our solar system, possibly even super earth planets, but they were either gravitationally ejected or gravitationally hurled into the sun. And as this inner solar system became cleared out and the giant planets were on the outskirts, it's only that leftover material that formed Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So it's possible that we might not even be the first planets in our solar system to occupy the space we're occupying now. It's possible that in the early days, there were larger ones. We have this eternal problem that when it comes to what we see in the universe, all we have access to are the survivors. Mm -hmm. Everything else we have to reconstruct and guess at. And that evidence is not always still present. It's like doing archaeology uh, without any anything to dig up. Mm. I mean, a lot of archaeology, it, like, I think that when you really start to look at archaeology, too, you realize how spotty the records are. And yeah. and fossil records as well. Like I think that this is any any time that in science you're looking into the past or you're looking at things that are really far away, this is the problem against which you spend your entire life fighting, which is that there is a fundamental limit to what can be said about the right now. And even if you're looking even if you're looking out at outer space or you're looking at how humans are right now, that's not telling you about how things were and so you have to use these secondary and tertiary markers for being able to reconstruct history that then become their own sorts of uh, they become the center point of a discipline in a really interesting way where it's like you think about something like uh, uh, let's say radiometric dating and radiometric dating we were we were talking to this guy who who's from Curtin University in Australia and he does a lot of radiometric dating for mining companies and he's like look it's exceptionally accurate and we can go and we can find these rocks and i can they have tell their you their own internal controls and everything they have their own internal controls we can tell you where the gold's going to be but the one thing that we can't really say is that the age of the earth is really four and a half billion years old. We can just say that that's the oldest that we've ever found a rock to be. Or the oldest that a rock would have melted and incorporated new uranium. Yeah. And then you look at something like the, the formation of the moon, right? And so the formation of the moon happens like 
four and a half-ish billions of years ago, and it's this huge body that crashes into the Earth. And then you start to think, you're like, well, what if there was like a whole surface melting event? And what if that was the moment where the clocks reset? And what if our what if our what if our clock is set to four and a half billion years because this is a historical legacy of the way that we've done science where we have a set of internally consistent dates, but if you shift the ratchet like one step further in the imagination of of probably where it will go, all of those dates will kind of, you know, it'll be like the the board inside the train station where all of the numbers start to shift and you'll you'll end up with like a different set of times. And they'll be still internally consistent with each other, but the distances between them and the the sort of the the flags that we plant right now will have to shift relative to all of time. Yeah, and that's part of why we have so many different ways of cross-checking this, right? When we talk about the age of the Earth, yes, we're using evidence that we find here on Earth. But when we also talk about like, well, what about the age of the sun, right? Well, we we have a model for how stars work and what a zero age main sequence star looks like and what sort of abundance of elements do we see in the sun. So we can say independently, okay, and the sun is 4.6 plus or minus 0.1 billion years old. And you can say, okay, and what about from meteorites, from little fragments of asteroids and comets that come in, and we're going to do radiometric dating of them. And we can find, oh, look, those all look like they're 4.56 billion years old, except this small population that, oh, guess what? When we examine these, these are coincident with the types of rocks we find on Mars. So a small percentage of meteorites on Earth have a Martian origin, not from asteroids or comets. Um, and so... Um, when you, when you, you date know, you the Martian to, rocks, do you get the same four and a half billion year date? Uh, no, the Martian rocks are imprinted from when they were ejected from Mars. I see. Um, so that that can tell you how long ago something was ejected from Mars. But no, the the because Mars is stratified and it's sort of like if you uh if you took a, a tortoise that died 10,000 years ago, uh the radioactive elements inside that tortoise are going to have a different carbon 14 to carbon 13 to carbon 12 ratio than something that formed naturally a long time ago because we have cosmic rays that hit Earth's atmosphere and produce carbon-14. And when you breathe in carbon dioxide, when you eat carbon-containing things, some of the carbon atoms you have contain carbon-14, but when you die, carbon-14 only radioactively decays. So that's how you use carbon-14 as a half-life marker. But that can get screwed up because when something happens and it produces a cosmic ray storm on Earth, like we think happened in the year 774 AD from tree rings that we've identified, that can artificially enhance your carbon-14 content for a while. So make sure that didn't happen during the organism's lifetime, or you're going to look and see a skewed ratio and incorrectly infer the date. So this is part of why I say you need multiple lines of evidence to know your confounding factors, to understand what's going to affect your data and why, even if it's something like the age of the earth, you don't want to rely on just one chronometer. One thing that's going to be really interesting is dating some of these interstellar objects as they come in. Um, I, I don't, there's only, I think, been three of them recorded, but uh, I, I only know of two. So if you know three... I've always That's thought great. that it's only two. You oh, always really? say that it's really? three. Okay, yeah. I know of Umuamua and I know of Borisov. Oh, well, I'm talking about ones that have crashed into the Earth. Yeah. So there's a couple that have crashed oh, into boy, the Earth. Oh, boy, you've been talking to that guy, huh? We talked to that guy. <laughs> we did talk to that guy. He's actually out there in the Pacific. I don't know if he's left yet. No, he hasn't left yet. He's planning an expedition to dig up one of these things yeah. um, from the floor of the ocean. Are you, are you suspicious of the data that he's collected? I'm suspicious of a lot of things that have come out of that person's mouth, yes. Mm. Interesting, because I mean, like the 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 data as presented seems. I guess it's plausible. just from a government, some sort of like NOAA registry. Or yeah, something. it was just like a NOAA registry where they looked at the trajectory of an object and were like, "This was too fast, and the angle is too weird for it to be a local object." 
So not everyone agrees with that because sure. that data contains no error bars. That <laughs> data does not have published error bars. And it, this is a very small object. Uh, and if I don't have access to the original data and I don't know how good it is, I'm very suspicious of it. I'll also say his plan for recovering it from the ocean bottom is really dubious. We have recovered in the history of objects striking Earth. We have recovered one object from the ocean ever. Whoa. And that object was only a, first off, that was the largest object to strike Earth in like a 10 year period. It was very slightly offshore and it was on a continental shelf. This is at the bottom of the ocean, way offshore, and was much smaller. He could go down there and find nothing. He could go down there and dig up an unrelated meteorite and say, I found it. He could go down there. You know, we have people who've gone to the old site of the Trojan War and dug up Troy. And then we've had people go and they dug up a different Troy. And then we've had people go and they dug up a different Troy. You think we're going to know that we dug up this meteor that we don't even have error bars on the data from where it hit the earth and we think we're going to... Look, it's got private funds. You can dump them into the ocean however you like. He's got Netflix on board now, actually. <laughs> That's great. That's great. We'll have... <laughs> You know, a lot of people that think this is science. All right. That's great. I mean, but, I, I think um, that it like the 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 guy is seeking to recover, I, I think, a lost spirit of exploration. And he's I mean, he, he's been pushing for the presence of an extraterrestrial object for pretty long time. And I think yes, that at this has. point, there's almost like a social cultural thing that's happening where I've seen that the community has really turned against him. And I think that it is creating this, this, it's nucleating the conflict where the more that the community turns against him, the more that he finds refuge in private money and the ability to continue these experiments by, you know, s seducing a different uh, population. And so it's it's like a it, it's it's like a hurricane that's begun, and the pressures are pushing on it to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And I I don't really know that that leads to a question, but I think that that's what's happening here is the fact that he's been basically like persona non grata in the community, and now it feels kind of like a well I'll show you type of thing. It might be, but you know I will tell you that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people studying objects in the solar system that strike Earth that pass through as interlopers uh, scrupulously, carefully, that don't rush to the media with grand claims that the data doesn't support. Um, and those are the voices that I tend to listen to. And so um, you will obviously get a lot of popularity especially if you come highly credentialed and you have had a successful career in a different subfield of astronomy and astrophysics. Um, and certainly you can use your credentials and you can use your franking privileges and you can use your good graces with the press and the media to generate a lot of publicity for a claim. That doesn't make the claim true. You have to look at the claim on the value of its merits, on the value of what the data suggests and what the data supports, and you cannot let wishful thinking color your conclusions. And I think this is one remarkably clear case of where the community is correctly urging caution mm. and someone else is setting them up, themselves up to be, oh, I am persecuted. I am the one being oppressed. I am the Galileo, and these people are the Catholic Church. Um, in fact, I believe the individual you talked to may have even named his project Project Galileo. I think it might be true. Um, you can we'll look confirm it up. that in a second. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I, I wanted to back it up a little bit. 
is it are people generally skeptical of the idea that there are even interstellar objects or is that more closer to consensus are there interstellar uh, media are not skeptical of the idea that there are interstellar objects that are that are we impacting the earth definitively no umumua and borisov were two objects that passed through our solar system and they did originate from beyond the solar system. Mm -hmm. But you're there asking specifically no about things that hit. Right, right. Yeah. Do Are people starting to consider that we've probably been hit by these things? Or is yeah, that pretty far out? Yeah, people consider that. Okay. Um, the issue is it would be very difficult to identify, based on a recovery mission, is this an object that originated from beyond our solar system, or is this an unusual object that came from within our solar system? Because we have seen unusual objects that have come from within our solar system. Like, for example, meteorites that didn't come from asteroids or comets that came from Mars. If you said, oh, we found this weird thing and it doesn't match any of the known meteorites or Mars, well, how do you know it didn't come from a different moon in our solar system that got struck by an object. We see craters all over them all the time. We know that it's easy to achieve escape velocity. So what are you going to find? Um, I guess the I only interesting know. thing would be if it was, if it had a really outrageous date to it, right? Cause I, I don't, would you expect interstellar meteors to have that same four and a half billion year ish date to them? Is no, no, okay. not unless okay. they formed at the same time our sun did. Now that doesn't mean we're not going to find things in the solar system that formed later. But if you find something and you say, I believe this is like 8 billion years old or 10 billion years old, then that starts to look very suspicious. How um, old are the oldest things that are tumbling around in our galaxy? Uh, over 13 billion years old. Uh, like objects, like rocky things that might enter into orbit here? Well, that's difficult to say because we have stars that are over 13 billion years old. And we assume that some of these stars uh, have planetary objects that are orbiting them. Uh, the universe, even 13 billion years ago, still had regions of space that had enough heavy elements in them that they should have formed rocky and icy uh, objects with interesting molecules on them. So um, I, I think that is a possibility. But what we should really be talking about is when the next interstellar object comes through, when the next interstellar interloper comes in, can we put ourselves in a position to take better measurements of it? Can we possibly get a sample of yeah. it? Can we take a look at this and see what are the characteristics of these objects and how are they similar or different mm. from the ones that we know from our own backyard? That's going to be because, really exciting. Because this is, this is something that we're starting to be able to study. One of the things that I'm excited about is uh, the upcoming Vera Rubin Observatory. This is, uh, this is a ground-based observatory that is going to take high-definition pictures of a large portion of the entire night sky periodically, very quickly. So if something is coming in and it is changing its position, like because it's streaming through the solar system very quickly, we should be able to detect it earlier than we've ever seen it before. And early detection is key if you want to run an intercept mission. So that's what I'm hopeful because you can learn a lot more in situ. You can learn a lot more going to an object and examining it with a suite of instruments than you can from afar with remote sensing. How, how fast can we plan a mission like that? Or how much lead, like, lead time would we have if we, if we detected something with this? Yeah, system? like is the slingshot like drawn back and ready to fire? Or is it something where it's going to take multiple generations of objects for people to get around to the point of actually... Because I mean, they, they sent the dart It's mission. in between those two. <laughs> we don't have the mission ready to go where people said, oh yeah, we know another one of these is coming. So the, the rocket is ready and the spacecraft <laughs> is ready and we're going to go. Uh, but what's what I predict is going to happen is at some point we will detect an object on its way in where we know, hey, with current technology, if we get on it now, we can get there when it passes through. At some point that will happen and that will be the impetus for let's do this mission. Um, so 
Uh, Because sometimes, look, when you see something in the outer solar system, gravity typically takes a long time to bring things in. When we found the first one, Oumuamua, it was already on its way out. If we had found Oumuamua when it was on its way in, we could have had up to like five or 10 years of lead time. Mm. Someday that's going to happen. Someday we're going to find an object on its way in and we're going to go, what's that? And we're going to check it out. And we're going to say, hey, the conditions are right. Let's build that intercept mission. And I think that's when it'll happen. And I'm hoping it happens sooner rather than later. But only time and more science will tell. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue with the idea that going to a place and collecting samples is far more fruitful than just waiting around for to find chunks of it. You know, yeah, primary or digging data. up a random piece of dirt at the bottom of the ocean <laughs> floor and going, well, I, I don't know what it is, but when I find something interesting, I'm going to go, I found it. Well, you know, maybe maybe he'll he'll be like, you know, I didn't find anything. We tried and we failed. That's possible. <laughs> want to play so bad <laughs> I am right, a gambling so, uh, dark energy it starts with a bang oh okay All right. I don't know we'll get to dark energy yeah maybe dark energy will play into that yeah we'll get there um, the big bang is is uh, the title of your of your blog and really your whole brand and everything and uh, how has that idea changed over the years since you... you know, that's a really good question, right? Um, so I will say when it was first proposed, the Big Bang meant two things at once. The Big Bang meant, okay, look, when we look at the universe today, we see that it's expanding, which means the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it appears to be moving away from us. And this is like if I were to take a ball of yeasty dough with raisins throughout it, and I let it leaven in, in zero gravity, right? Because I'm smart enough to put it on the International Space Station. So it starts leavening. And what do the raisins do? They all expand away from each other. If I am on one of those raisins, if one of those raisins is a galaxy, I'm going to see the raisins nearby me expanding away from me. From my perspective, it's going to look like all of those nearby raisins are moving away from me. But the farther away a raisin is, a raisin towards the outskirts of the ball of dough is going to appear to be expanding away from me faster. It's not because it's moving through space. Space is the dough. It's not because it's moving through space. It's because the space itself is expanding. And what's remarkable about this picture is if I am any of these raisins and the ball of dough is big enough, I'm going to see all the raisins around me expanding away from me, receding away from me. It does imply that so there's the a raisin bang, that you could be standing on at the edge where you can't see any raisins in one direction, though, right? Okay, just don't assume there's an edge. Okay. Or if there is an edge, you're not close enough to it that you can see <laughs> okay, it. Okay, all right, all right. Because that's, that's the We're conditions We're staying away from the see. boundary conditions. All right, that's fair. That's right, that's right. Don't, don't pick the no, that's most a, That's a really case. interesting point, though, because... <clears throat> when we say that we can, when we talk about the universe in astronomy, we really just mean as far as we can see something like that. When we talk about the most distant stars, we, we don't know if there's anything beyond that. Uh, right. Do, That's right. Or, or we, we can't measure what's beyond that. Someday, if you wait long enough, you will, because there is light from beyond where we can currently see today that's on its way to us. Someday that light will arrive. So if I said, if I did the math and I said, okay, how much of the universe can I see today versus how much will I ever be able to see? Uh, I'll be able to see about another 130% over what I can see today in terms of volume of the universe. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I lived infinitely long, Light that is on its way that hasn't arrived at Earth yet will someday arrive at Earth. Earth might not be here for most of it, but someday it'll eventually arrive. Mm. How do you but arrive at that 130%? How'd I derive it? Yeah, yeah like, w w that's just like, it was such a specific number. Well, I calculated it a while ago. Uh, the way you calculated it is you know how fast the universe is expanding today. You know how long ago the Big Bang occurred. You know what makes up the universe, so you know how it's expanded over its lifetime and how it will continue to expand in the in the future. 
and you know what the speed of light is. So you know how far you can potentially see. Got it. So that um, that that paradigm, uh, this the the Hubble relationship with, with this, the distance redshift, this was one of the original ideas with the Big Bang. Is, is that correct? That's right. That's right. So this was first, so we call it the Hubble expansion because Hubble initially got all the credit for it. But it turns out that two people independently put these pieces together before Hubble did. Uh, the first is George Lemaitre, who did it in 1927. The second was an American named Howard Robertson, who did it in 1928. Hubble did it in 1929, uh, and we give him all the credit for it because Hubble Hubble was a good marketer. But also, uh, you know, Hubble also had the data himself. Like Hubble was the one taking the galaxy data. Lemaitre and Robertson both used Hubble's data to arrive at this conclusion before Hubble himself did. But what this means is, look, if the universe is expanding today, then that means in the past, it was smaller and smaller and smaller. And what if I extrapolate back in time and say, oh, what if it was even smaller and even smaller and even smaller? And I extrapolate all the way back to back in the day, it had two names, neither of which was the Big Bang. One of them was the cosmic egg. Mm -hmm. The other name was the primeval atom. Mm. Um, and that's what they originally called this state, that if you extrapolate everything back to a time, T equals zero, size is zero, uh, where all the matter is condensed into a singular point. Mm. And that was the idea of the Big Bang. The universe started off small, tiny, from a singularity, and expanded and cooled and gravitated and formed stars and galaxies ever since. It's really interesting That's that... the original uh, idea. It's really interesting that a lot of cultures came up with something approximating that original idea without any astronomical data whatsoever. Like the cosmic egg idea is very foundational to a lot of mythologies of different cultures. And like the very idea of a creation is almost, almost ubiquitous across cultures. Yeah, and um, and Lamatra was a priest. Lemaitre <laughs> was a Catholic priest. Yeah. He was a Belgian priest. And there were a lot of people, especially uh, in more secular countries like the United Kingdom, uh, that were ideologically opposed to the idea of the Big Bang. Uh, in fact, the name the Big Bang was coined by one of the theory's detractors, Fred Hoyle, who couldn't believe this idea, this religious idea of some Big Bang, which is not even scientific, as he told BBC Radio 70 years ago, uh, could, could ever be considered. Um, but yet you make specific predictions. You say, okay, well, listen, if the universe emerged from this denser state in the past, then what would have happened? Well, universe is full of radiation and radiation the energy of radiation is defined by its wavelength longer wavelength is cooler and low energy light shorter wavelength is hotter and higher energy light so if i go back in time and the universe is smaller the wavelength of any light in it was shorter and if I go back to shorter and shorter wavelengths, that means the younger, smaller universe was also hotter. So what happens if I take a very dense universe and I make it very hot? Well, there's going to come a point where it's too hot to have neutral atoms because atoms are made out of nuclei and electrons. Make it hot enough, you ionize the electrons and everything becomes a plasma go even earlier than that. And it becomes so hot that atomic nuclei become impossible and you'll blast them apart into individual protons and neutrons. Go even hotter and maybe you can't even form matter without also producing an equal amount of antimatter. Go even hotter, even earlier, even denser, bah, bah, bah. What do you arrive at? And so these are some of the questions that people asked. This led to some predictions for the Big Bang. It said, okay, there should come a period as the universe expands and cools where you can form stable atomic nuclei. 
So there should be this period early on when the universe is only a few minutes old after the Big Bang, where you have nuclear fusion between the protons and neutrons that are present. And you can run the equations because you understand nuclear physics to make a set of predictions. How much hydrogen, how much deuterium, how much helium-3, how much helium-4, how much lithium should you produce? And then you go and you try and find gas clouds that have never formed stars and you try and measure how much they produce and how much exists and do your predictions agree? And then you can say, okay, well, when you form neutral atoms, right, you should go from a universe that's full of matter and radiation to one that's full of neutral atoms and this radiation. And at that point, radiation scatters, interacts very easily with free electrons but it will only interact with neutral atoms if it's the right wavelength to get absorbed by that atom and excite the electron to the right energy level. So when you form neutral atoms, there should be this leftover bath of radiation, which back when they were calling the Big Bang the primeval atom, this leftover bath of radiation was theorized as the primeval fireball, which is a great name for it. Um, so in 19, in the mid 1960s, they actually detected this leftover radiation. That's what we call the cosmic microwave background today. And that's why people talk about that as the smoking gun for the Big Bang. Um, and you also say, well, if the universe started out uniform and dense and expanded and gravitated and cooled, what else should you see? Well, you would expect that there's in early time where there are no stars and then you form stars for the first time and then they build up and you form galaxies and galaxy clusters and networks of galaxy clusters and you should see galaxies grow and evolve over time and you should see the cosmic web form and take shape over time because when you look back in the universe it takes hundreds of millions or even billions of years for that light to reach you when you look farther away in space, you're also looking back in time. So all of these types of observations add up, accumulate as independent pieces of evidence to support the Big Bang. In fact, uh, in the 2010s, we even found evidence for an earlier prediction of the Big Bang that at some point it should have produced large numbers of neutrinos and anti-neutrinos that still exist in the universe today. And those neutrinos should imprint their signature on both the primeval fireball light and also in the large scale structure in the universe. And we teased those effects out in, I believe, 20. 15 and 2017, respectively. Um, and so that's a very obscure prediction of the Big Bang that was confirmed. But now, today, because you asked about how has this changed, we only think about the Big Bang as that hot, dense, early state. We don't think about going all the way back to a singularity hmm. because when you try to extrapolate back to a singularity, you get predictions that either make no sense or that conflict with what you observe. And you're, are so you talking about the bicep results? About the what? Like the B-mode polarization where like, because they've been looking for proof of inflation, but they haven't been able to find any substantive evidence of it. Oh, you listened to someone who was working on one of those experiments, didn't you? Yeah, we, we, had, just... we had Brian Keating on the show. We haven't released it yet. Yep, That's something Brian Keating would say. That's good. Um, so that is partially true. I'll give you partial credit for that. You, that is probably exactly what he said. Um, that is not 100% true. It is true that cosmic inflation is our leading theory for what happened before the Big Bang to set it up. And it is true that finding gravitational waves from inflation, if they come at a large enough amplitude, they will imprint their signature on the polarization, specifically the B-mode polarization of that cosmic microwave background light. That part is true. It's not true that that's the only evidence we have for inflation or that we would look for. In fact, we wouldn't believe in inflation or consider it as seriously do if we didn't already have large amounts of observational evidence 
in favor of it, because this is what you do when you have a theory. Let's say you have an old theory like the Big Bang and you say, okay, but I have a new theory now. I have cosmic inflation. What do I have to do as the inflation theory haver to convince a community that my theory is better than the Big Bang? You have to do three things to me. These are my rules. These are not everyone's rules. These are my rules. First thing you have to do is you have to reproduce all of the successes that the old theory did. That's a prerequisite. If you're the Big Bang theory and I'm the inflationary theory, everything that the Big Bang successfully does, I also have to do that. I have to be able to create all the successes of the hot Big Bang. That's the first thing I have to do. Second thing I have to do, there have to be some things that the Big Bang doesn't explain. We see them, but the Big Bang can't explain them. These are things like, hey, if I look out this way to the edge of the observable universe, and I see the universe has some temperature, and I look out this way, the other direction, and I see the universe has the same exact temperature, why do both parts of the universe in different directions that have been expanding since the hot Big Bang that have never had time to exchange information with each other across the expanding universe, how do they get to have the same temperature? The universe, as it expands, it could either, I'm going to set you up with three possibilities, right? Big Bang, boom, is the starting gun, and now there's a cosmic race. The universe is expanding, but gravitation is trying to pull everything back together. What's going to happen? Well, I can imagine a universe where gravitation wins the race, right? Universe expands, but gravity pulls on it, and it's expanding, but gravity's pulling, and it's winning, and it's pulling, and it's pulling, and the universe reaches a maximum size and it stops expanding and it slows down and stops and the expansion starts to reverse and it starts contracting and it ends in a big crunch because gravity wins. That's a possibility. Or I can imagine- Which sounds fundamentally elastic. It, it reminds me of a big rubber ball or something that's all tied together. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, but I can imagine the opposite possibility that maybe the expansion is too much for the stuff in the universe. And it expands and gravity pulls it back together, but can't quite do it. And it just keeps expanding forever and ever and goes off. And gravity keeps slowing everything down, but it can't quite make it recollapse. And then, you know, you read Goldilocks and the Three Bears. What if the porridge isn't too hot? What if the porridge isn't too cold? What if the porridge is just right? What if it expands and it expands and it slows and it asymptotes and gravitation's gonna make the expansion rate aim towards zero, but it'll never quite be enough to turn around. If only there were one more atom in the universe, it would have stopped and turned, but we don't. And it's just on that knife edge case. That's the case that it looks like we live in. Hmm. If the universe were going to recollapse uh, spatially, you would predict that space is closed and curved positively like a sphere. If the universe were open, if it were going to expand forever and ever, you would predict the shape of the universe would be like a saddle, where one direction is curved like this and the other direction is curved in the opposite direction. The way you tell, by the way, geometrically, is you draw a triangle on your universe. In flat space, the internal angles of a triangle always add up to 180 degrees. In positively curved space, they always add up to more than 180 degrees. And in negatively curved space, they always add up to less than 180 degrees. Our universe is really, 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 really flat to the best that we can tell. Why? Big Bang doesn't know why. Mm. But another thing that the Big Bang predicts is, look, if I made my universe arbitrarily hot, arbitrarily dense, there should be leftover relics in the universe today from that high energy epic, from that high energy moment in time, there are signatures that should still persist today that I can go out and look for, and we don't see any of them. Hmm. So the second thing my new theory needs to do is all these things that we observe about the universe, but that the Big Bang does not explain, my new theory better explain those things. Hmm. And inflation that. does for all of them. Inflation says, oh, well, it's the same temperature over there as it is over there, because at some point in the past, the universe was expanding exponentially, 
And so these regions that look disconnected today were actually connected in the past. And the reason the universe looks flat today is because if I take anything, a sphere, a saddle, a balloon, whatever, and I blow it up big enough and big enough and big enough and big enough, it's sort of like going out into your backyard and trying to measure the curvature of the earth from your backyard alone. You're going to say, oh, well, for the limited little region of square that I have, my part of the earth looks flat. I can't tell that it's curved from this little bit because I can't see enough of it. If I took either a sphere or a saddle or any surface and I blew it up large enough and I only looked at a small enough part of it, it would look flat to me. So if inflation did that, if inflation stretched space to be really, really big, then the part I can see, the part in my observable universe looks flat. But the third part is really cool because if inflation says, hey, you never got up to that arbitrarily hot, arbitrarily dense temperature. You only had inflation and hot Big Bang start, but you only reached this maximum temperature. Then that's why you don't see these leftover high energy relics because the universe never got to that high energy since the start of the hot Big Bang. That's why the third thing is so important, right? First thing, I want to reproduce all the Big Bang successes. Second thing, I want to explain the things we observe that the Big Bang can. The third thing is, if I can take the Big Bang theory, and I can take inflationary theory, and I can say, let's make side-by-side -side predictions of these two ideas that differ from one another, then can I go out and measure them? To Brian Keating's credit, B modes from inflation from the gravitational waves produced during inflation are one of those predictions. They are one of those predictions. We've only been able to say if they exist, they're below this magnitude. Because what inflation is spectacular at is predicting what the spectrum of those fluctuations should look like. What inflation is model dependent for is what amplitude are those fluctuations. Those amplitudes could be 10% or 1% of the signal, or they could be like 10 to the minus 34 multiplied by that signal. So right now we've been able to say, yeah, they're about less than 1%, maybe less than a 10th of a percent. That's the region we're looking at. But that's not the only test we have. We also say, okay, I predict that inflation is going to seed the universe with a spectrum of fluctuations because we live in a quantum universe. And in a quantum universe, you have these fluctuations, like these quantum fluctuations, particles and antiparticles popping in and out of existence, uh, just, just fluctuations in the rest energy of space. But if your universe is expanding exponentially, if it's inflating, it's like you get these little fluctuations and they get stretched across the universe. And as these fluctuations are getting stretched, new ones are getting created and getting stretched and new ones are getting created and getting stretched. So you wind up with this superposition of waves on all of these different cosmic scales that add up on top of each other. And that should translate in the hot big bang to what we call a spectrum of density fluctuations, of temperature fluctuations. And we see those temperature fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. Hmm. And they agree with inflation's predictions. The Big Bang was agnostic about it. The Big Bang did not know how to make those predictions. We can look at that radiation and say, okay, what is the maximum possible temperature the universe could have reached? in the hot Big Bang. If it's up at the Planck scale, that's arbitrarily hot. If it's some finite value below the Planck scale, then the hot Big Bang never got that hot. We didn't have that singularity in the hot Big Bang. And we see that the maximum temperature is something like a factor of a thousand lower than that Planck temperature. We can look at the types of fluctuations that exist and say, you know, there are a lot of things that could be constant in the universe. Uh, you can have like constant pressure in a region. You could have constant volume in a region. You could have constant temperature in a region, or you can have constant entropy. 
What inflation predicts is all of these temperature and density fluctuations you have, they should all have constant entropy in them. This is what we call adiabatic fluctuations, as opposed to constant spatial curvature fluctuations. Those would be isocurvature fluctuations. In the classical Big Bang, you can have any amount. In inflation, they have to all be adiabatic. Guess what? We've identified that at least 98.3% of them are adiabatic. And at most, 1.7% of them consistent with zero, but at most 1.7% are isocurvature. So when people say, we don't have any observational evidence for inflation, I would point them to the suite of evidence that we have specifically for inflation versus the Big Bang without inflation and watch the scales go thunk because mm -hmm. this is important stuff. This is what you want from a theory. I reproduce the successes of the old theory. I explain the things that we saw that we couldn't explain with the old theory. And I made new predictions that I then went out and measured and tested and guess what? The predictions agreed with what I saw for the new theory and disagreed for the old theory. That's all you can ask for. The fact that I have an additional prediction that I haven't yet been able to tell which is which doesn't negate, no, we already have good evidence for inflation. I'd love to have more evidence for inflation. I'd love to be able to measure B-mode polarization for the cosmic microwave background. And I think it's still a worthy endeavor in science we should be doing because you should always be learning more about the universe, but you should never pretend that we don't have the evidence we already have. Mm. I hope that answered your question. That was a long answer. I mean, I, there was so much in there where I'm like, okay, so to get at the start of it, it seems like what you're saying is that the modern version of the Big Bang, which was at one point seen as this, you know, cosmic egg of infinite, temperature and density seems to be no longer the perspective that people have about the beginning because the evidence for inflation is greater and the evidence that is given by inflation is that it never got to be quite so hot. And so you can't have it be this like dense singularity because the evidence doesn't support that configuration of matter. That That's Excellent. That is correct. But I'll throw in as a caveat. This is saying, look, the universe we have today is expanding and cooling, and it was hotter and denser in the past. And the hottest and densest it ever got that we know of came at the very end of inflation and this beginning we can call the hot big bang. But inflation itself can only take us back a certain amount. We go back to that certain amount, and here's the problem with inflation. When you expand something exponentially, right, you can say, look, I can go down to the smallest imaginable scale at which physics makes sense, the Planck scale. Any smaller than that, and the tiniest quantum fluctuation will make a black hole. I don't find that useful. That's my physics breaking down. My laws of physics break down there. That only means, look, if I go from that tiny, tiny, tiny Planck scale up to what becomes the size of the observable universe at the energies and speeds and rates that inflation happens at, that's a tiny fraction of a second. How long did inflation actually go on for? I don't know. I just know it went on for at least this tiny fraction of a second. How did inflation get started? Did it get started? Was it eternal? What state did inflation arise from? These are questions we still don't know the answer to. You, you said something. I, I want to stop you. Hold on. You said something about the, the length of time that it takes to go from the playing scale to the size of the observable universe would be a fraction of a second? In, term, in the time it takes inflation. And this is great. This is a good point to emphasize because it's not very intuitive. 
you normally think, oh, well, everything's limited by the speed of light, right? Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So how do you go from 10 to the minus 30 something meters to billions of light years in a fraction of a second? And the answer is space itself can double in size in a certain amount of time. And this is why it's so powerful that inflation is an exponential expansion. Because what happens in exponential, it means that in a certain amount of time, things double in size. Yeah. Double so the length, the, double the width, double the depth. So the th does that imply that the... Okay. How... Based off of the inflationary theory, does that imply that the entirety of the observable universe universe is actually formed in that small segment of time? Um, or that that is, if it had continued at this this given rate, that it could have formed everything in, in the observable universe, but that it actually s slowed down or something like that? Where, where so does it what, land? What What I would say happens is you have an expansion rate and during inflation that rate is constant mm. but because that rate is constant that means if i'm going to double in size in this amount of time then when that amount of time passes again it's double again double again double again and when that amount of time passes again double again double again double again it's even bigger how many doublings do you need yeah, that's until the you go from this tiny size to the observable universe? And the answer is about 300, about a, a few hundred doublings, which means, well, how fast was the rate of expansion? How long did it take things to double in size during inflation? 10 to the minus 10 seconds, 10 to the minus 20 seconds, 10 to the minus 30 seconds. Well, if it took that amount of time, then for a hundred doublings, then that's 10 to the minus eight seconds or 10 to the minus 18 seconds or 10 to the minus 28 seconds. When we talk about inflation, typical time scales for doubling at the conditions most theorists use are between 10 to the minus 33 and 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So, and so what that implies is that the entire universe was formed in fractions of a second. Like it went from this from this dense location to the hundreds couple doublings within less right. than a second. And, and what that means is who knows how many trillions, quadrillions, quintillions, Googles, how many doublings actually occurred before inflation ended here. We don't know. All we know is that what we see is consistent with a universe that had at least a hundred doublings. And are you at saying? Least, are you saying at least a hundred doublings because there's a limit to how far we can see, or because there was something that was earlier that is is hidden by by the model? Well, there's nothing earlier that we can see. Okay, so where do the, the but, trillions of doublings come from? Well, the trillions of doublings come from. Uh, there could have been, all we have is a lower limit. We have a lower limit on at least this much happened. And that's we the hundreds. We have no upper limit. We have no limit on how mo at most, how much at most happened. Because we can't, because we, we're limited by how much of the universe we can see? Or like what, why, why that, can't we put an upper limit? limit? That is okay. what sets the okay. limit. Okay. The limit is set by time and space. That mm. only this much time has elapsed since the Big Bang and the universe has expanded at this rate. So there's a limit to what we can see in time and in space. But that there could be, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so obtuse sometimes. Like in, No, 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 this is good. You are asking cutting edge questions that we, this is like my differential equations teacher said, right? Some things nobody knows. And now I'm hoping you're asking about the things that at least I know that you don't, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're <laughs> going to ask about something that nobody knows. So go ahead. 
Yeah, I'm just trying to like, I mean, every time that I've ever seen a presentation on inflation, the subtext has been, you know, your puny brain is too little to understand the the, the majesty of this theory. And so now that I have you in front of me, I know I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to hold you. You don't to have it. a puny brain. And look, no one when you learn about this stuff, it's not because you're some special person with a giant brain who can understand it. You, you just spent more time with it. So what what are you having trouble wrapping your head around well just this 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 seems like a huge error bar if you're like look it's between 300 and a trillion doublings and i'm trying to figure it's out like between 300 and infinity so it's where does the where does the infinity, infinity lie like so if the universe is 13.8 billion light years across and we're like this is how big it's gotten in 13.8 billion years then don't we have i see a fundamental confusion which is can you explain to us the difference between how far we can see and the age of the universe? Yes, that's a good place to start. I'm, I was trying to lead okay. there in like an obtuse way. Are okay. they related? So, Are they the same? Uh, so it, it would be the same if the universe weren't expanding. But, but didn't we get to the, the point that it was a, flat and has like, has like, re- didn't we recently, say that we're in, Recently, but in the past it wasn't. That's the inflation idea. But we're in a Goldilocks universe. Right? Didn't moment, we at the are moment. in the Goldilocks universe in the sense that the expansion rate and the total amount of stuff in the universe means our universe is spatially flat. Triangles have internal angles of 180 degrees, even on the scale of the universe. But we'll get back to how you measure happens, the triangle on the scale of the universe later. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> the way you do it is you say, okay, look, I, right, you go, you go side angle, side. Right, you know, you know, you remember back in geometry <laughs> that would be ways you roughly, prove roughly. two triangles are congruent, <laughs> side angle side is congruent to try it. So what you do is you say, okay, when I look back at the leftover light from the CMB, from the cosmic microwave background, the primeval fireball, I see there are hot spots, I see there are cold spots, and from physics, I know what sets the scale of these spots. Um, I know that okay, look, I have matter, it's trying to collapse and I have radiation that pushes back against it. And that sets the physical size scale for how big the hot spots and the cold spots are. Then I go and observe them, but I say, look, I've got this expanding universe and it has a geometry to it. So if the universe were saddle shaped, I would see these spots appear with this smaller size. If the universe were sphere shaped, I would see these temperature fluctuations appear with this larger size. And if the universe were completely flat, I'd see these fluctuations appear with a peak scale that was this Goldilocks size. Got it. And that's what we see. That's why we can say the universe is flat to within 99.8%. It, it could be, but this is, again, you can only draw your conclusions to the quality of your observations. Mm. Yeah, of course. But but the other thing you're asking about some, is, there, look, there, I to... the universe is 13.8 billion years since the Big Bang. How far away is the farthest thing I can see? And that is 46.1 billion light years away. Whoa. And that's a combination of, okay, things were very close together but expanding very rapidly. So here are two things separated by some distance and the Big Bang sets off and they expand and the expansion slows and slows and slows and the light that's emitted, what happens, right? I'm the observer, here's the emitter. Well, you emit light and we expand and we're expanding apart and the light is traveling and we're expanding apart and the light is traveling. And finally, the light gets here. How far away is this object today? That's where 46.1 billion light years come from. Because it's not just the amount of distance that the light has traveled. It's the fact that the distance between the source and the emitter, sorry, the emitter and the observer has also expanded. And that comes from the, the, the redshift? Uh, redshift is folded into it. That's why that's why the light's wavelength is stretched. But like, what but I'm light, saying is like how y- you know how uh, how m- how words, much expansion has yeah happened? how much expansion has occurred because you're looking at redshift. Well, there's well that is that is a way you can measure it. You can measure how much expansion has occurred from measuring the redshift. For example, 
when I see the light from the cosmic microwave background, I know that that has redshifted by a factor of 1,090 from when it was emitted. And I know that because I know, oh, well, the universe had to be this hot based on the amount of radiation that's in it to ionize all the atoms that was in it. And then when the atoms became neutral, then you can see the radiation. So based on the temperature of the radiation I see today versus the temperature that it would take that same number of photons to ionize all of the atoms in it, how much has the universe expanded? And that's the furthest thing we can optically see. That's the furthest thing we can measure with light in the universe. But that's good. That takes us from 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang back to just 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe was more than a thousand times smaller in each direction. So that's a really good consistency check that the Big Bang works the way we think it should. There's some, there is some tension between the Hubble uh, expansion and the CMB expansion. Isn't that correct? That there, there... Right. So there are multiple, and this is a good thing. It's a good thing that there are multiple ways to measure how fast is the universe expanding. In general, there are two classes of ways to measure it. One is to take something that was imprinted really early on in the universe, it expands and you measure it today. That's the CMB method. That's also the baryon acoustic oscillation version, which is basically, look, you have, I talked about these hot spots and cold spots in the CMB. The cold spots are the ones that grow into galaxies and large scale structure. The hot spots are the ones that give up their matter to the denser regions around them. So if I say, okay, this is the distance between cold spots in the early universe. And now I say, oh, look, well, this is the average distance between galaxies today. What is that average distance? Where is there a peak in the distribution of galaxies at all of these different redshifts, at all of these different times where the universe was expanded to different sizes? That's another way. I also get the same answer as the CMB method. That's using large scale structure or baryonic acoustic oscillations as they're sometimes called. But that also gives me that same number about 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But if I use other methods and say, oh, look, I'm gonna look at distant objects and I'm gonna see how far are they away from me? How fast is the universe expanding? I get a different answer. I get about 74 kilometers a second per megaparsec. So that little difference, that 9% difference between these two sets of method, this is this is a conundrum. This is something that we don't know why these two sets of methods consistently give disparate answers. Mm. A 9% difference 20 years ago, we would have thrown a party that we only got a 9% difference between these two different methods. But today, we are so precise. So 20 years ago, we would have been thrilled that we got these two measurements that only disagreed at 9%. But today, the errors on each set of measurements is down to 1%. So if there's a 9% difference between the two types of methods mm -hmm. and only a 1% error on them, mm -hmm. something isn't adding up. And so many of us, including me most days, <laughs> are hopeful that this is a clue that will help us move beyond our current understanding mm. of what's going on with the universe. You know, the, the thing that troubles me the most about it, and always has since I was a kid, is uh, that these theories rely on essentially warping physics itself. And it's something that we don't really entertain in other branches of science is that we can change the fundamental rules of the game uh, to, suit the, to, to suit some theoretical explanation for how things happen. Like, if physics can change in the deep past, could everything just fall apart one second when I'm going to, you know, get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night or something? It just seems like we're, we're introducing this possibility that's 
somewhat terrifying that that physics itself could just change like what what's the mechanism by what why would why does physics change like that you know it's like i understand that uh if we fit all of this data back we we end up with the this this point where the only thing that we can think of to explain it is that physics changed in this uh dynamical way but it isn't well, it, it isn't, isn't it necessarily just... the only explanation mm, right mm. there are two explanations and physics changing is one of them okay but the other one is that the ingredients in the universe change mm. not that the physics changed the physics stayed the same but the ingredients mm. changed and we see ingredients changing all the time whenever you have anything that's unstable and it decays that's a change uh those types of phase transitions those types of decays they happen all the time and they play very important roles in the universe we had that happen when the universe was young and we had the electroweak symmetry and the higgs symmetry and that broke and that gave every particle that has a rest mass in the universe its rest mass that was important that wasn't the laws of physics changing that was it undergoing a transition when we formed protons and neutrons from quarks and gluons the laws of physics didn't change we expanded and cooled through a transition when we formed neutral atoms for the first time the laws of physics didn't change we went through a transition but what all, all of those de they all seem to depend upon this the inflationary rates uh being ex ex uh, accelerating or or somehow changing right like the, the fun of space itself that, is that is all hot big bang way after inflation mm, mm, mm. so this is this was going to happen whether inflation happened or not you needed a hot big bang but in the aftermath of the hot big bang this is just expanding cooling becoming less dense and here's what spontaneously happens so the question is look we have something in our universe two ingredients actually that we don't know what they are. We can identify them indirectly from their effects on things, but we have dark matter, we have dark energy, and we don't know what they are. My bet, and this is just a hunch, but I'm not the only one who has it, is that something going on in the dark sector with either dark matter or dark energy is behind this discrepancy mm. that perhaps either dark matter or dark energy undergoes some sort of transition just like the normal matter in the universe undergoes many different transitions um and perhaps if early on we imprinted this signal and then a transition occurred and then later on the universe is expanding at this new rate that would be a way to reconcile this. Uh, people working on this from both the theoretical and observational viewpoints call this early dark energy because they think there was more dark energy early on and that dark energy partially decayed and that's what created this discrepancy. Not the only answer, possibly not even the right answer, but it's one of the things people are exploring because it could resolve this this Hubble tension. Mm. That's really interesting. Something Does that, that make sense? I mean, it, I think what you, if I just like paraphrase it back, but I think that you are saying that if there was some undetected material or some energetic phenomena that's going on, it could, much in the same way gravity is holding back this expansion right now, it was perhaps antagonizing it in, in some related way that changed the, uh, the expansion rate or something. There is a mechanism, we just can't quite get to it right now. Yeah, I mean, the way I the way I like to think about it is if I take a bottle of water or a two liter bottle of soda or something um, and I put a bunch of cinnamon on the top. And I poked a hole in the bottom of the bottle. The water will all come down. The cinnamon. Where will one grain of cinnamon land? most of the cinnamon will land in the bottom of the bottle, right? At the lowest points. But some of the cinnamon is going to land on the hilltops between the different divots in the bottom or in the middle of that. So if I had balls or 
drops of cinnamon or anything else I wanted, some of them go down to the equilibrium state, the lowest possible state, that true minimum state. Others get caught at a higher point and only later will they make it all the way down to the true minimum. That is something that can happen in physics by one of two ways. It could either roll down like a ball rolling down a hill or quantum mechanically, it can tunnel from an unstable false minimum or a quasi-stable false minimum to the true minimum. Both of those ways are ways that the transition can occur. If I have, if I happen to have been in a universe where my cinnamon landed on a high part instead of at the lowest part, it'll get to that lowest part eventually. One of the big things we could worry about, I don't worry about it, but we could worry about it, is what if dark energy that we have today is in one of those false minima? What if the zero point energy of empty space could actually be at a lower value? If that quantum tunneling occurs and we go from our current value to that lowest value, it will destroy the universe because it will change the laws and the constants of the universe. And all the things that are bound together, including you, me, anything made of atoms, nuclei, electrons, etc., cetera, uh, it will reconfigure itself. And that bubble of destruction will propagate outward at the speed of light. If that happens anywhere in the universe, we won't have any way of knowing until that bubble gets here because nothing travels faster than light. That's terrifying. What is the cinnamon in this analogy? <laughs> Are we the, the cinnamon, cinnamon is the actual value of the field, right? I put cinnamon on top because quantum fields spread out over time and space and over the entire, uh, over the entire what I'll call phase space that's available to them. So it's whatever how things, all the possible how things look, outcomes, basically. the cinnamon occupies it, which is why the cinnamon sits on top of the water that drains out. But as the water drains out, because the energy of the universe drops, cinnamon doesn't always go to the bottom. Sometimes it gets hung up in a false minimum. It's like there's like hidden variable actors that have been sculpting the history of events. And the, and the shape of the bottle is the dark energy, dark matter? That's the, so the, the, the juice, the shape of the bottle, the basically the bottom of the bottle where it lands, that's the zero point energy. That's the zero point energy of space. If it's actually zero, then there would be no dark energy. If it's a positive non-zero value, where that winds up defines the value of dark energy. Mm. We know from observations that we do have a positive non-zero value. And we do not know why, we do not know where it came from. So the analogy I made is a, a very simple one, but it's a, it's a generic way to describe a possible phase transition and a false minimum. And so what is, our, what is the strongest evidence for the existence of dark energy and dark matter? Because I know that the galactic rotation problem leads us to dark matter. But I don't That's one of the pieces of evidence for dark matter. Uh, I would say a stronger piece of evidence for dark matter is when we look at galaxy clusters. In isolation, galaxy clusters will bend the light coming from behind them, right? Because gravity acts like a lens. You have light coming from behind you, and this large amount of mass is going to bend the light. And so you can see these streaks and arcs and bent, sometimes even multiple images of background things. That's the effects of gravity. When you have two galaxy clusters, before the galaxy clusters collide, you see, oh, there's two spots. While the galaxy clusters are colliding, you see, hey, look, I know, that you have these individual galaxies, and then between them, you have a bunch of gas. And when the clusters collide, the gas heats up and emits X-rays and gets stuck in the middle. But the clusters, the individual galaxies themselves, pass through each other. And here's the cool thing. Once the gas collides, it gets stuck in the middle. It separates out. And it turns out that about... 85% of the mass, of the normal matter mass, 
is in this form of gas. So when you see x-rays coming from clusters, that tells you that's where most of the mass is in terms of normal matter. But as these galaxy clusters collide and pass through each other, you start to see, oh, look, the total amount of matter stayed with the collection of galaxies. It didn't go where most of the normal matter is. So the fact that you see the mass is here, 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 because it settles back down. The fact that you see that separation between normal matter and where the gravitational effects are, that's really strong evidence for dark matter. Hmm. So I would say that's even stronger evidence than galactic rotation, because hmm. with galactic rotation, you can imagine well, maybe I could just change the laws of physics instead of having dark matter. With this stuff, there's no way you could have laws of physics that say, okay, when the clusters are here, uh, the matter is here and the gravity is here. And then when the clusters are here, the matter is here, but the gravity is here. There's no way to do that with a modified theory of gravity um, because gravity can't be where the matter is, and then not where the matter is. So Gravity has to go where the matter goes. Well, basically, what you're saying is that when you have these two groups that, uh, with these two clusters of galaxies that collapse, what happens is that there's a there's a section between them that starts to emit X rays, and then as they pass through each other, it remains a source of X rays, even though they have moved away from each other. The the gas stays in the middle where the collision occurred and gets separated from where the individual galaxies are. I sort of look at it like, look, if I fired two guns of birdshot at each other, collisions between those pellets are going to be rare. They're going to mostly pass through each other. If I took two Nerf balls and fired them at each other, they're going to smack together. Uh, if I took two clouds of gas, they're going to collide and heat up and slow down. That's what emits x-rays. But if I took dark matter, dark matter doesn't collide with anything. It's just going to pass through like it's invisible. So that's how we can tell, oh, this really strongly favors dark matter. I mean, I could point to other lines of evidence like the cosmic web and interacting pairs of galaxies and, and lots of other things. But I would say if you ever meet someone who wants to tell you that, oh, it's only rotation, rotating galaxies, and maybe we could just modify the laws of set instead, make sure you bring up colliding galaxy clusters. Make we, sure you bring we, up the to be fair cluster, though, we can the Gordo cluster, the musket ball cluster, because that separation between where the normal matter is and where the effects of gravity are. That's very strong evidence for dark matter. That was put forth as an empirical proof of dark matter some 16 or 17 years ago. And in the time since, we've identified dozens of these systems. They all show the same separation between dark matter and normal matter post-collision and no separation pre-collision. So do we actually see the galaxies smash into each other and then pass each other? Or that takes a really long time. Are we looking at different snapshots of different systems? You, you have to look at different snapshots, right? This is something that happens on many different uh, time scales. So you're getting a set of snapshots, but if you get enough snapshots of enough systems, you can sort of get a good picture for what happens at each phase along the way. Um, hmm. there's one called the train wreck cluster as well, where I believe three or four clusters are colliding together, Interesting. Uh, which is pretty amazing. I think that it's been a good two hours. I appreciate that you've spent the time with us. Um, <laughs> I would, I would love for you to come back because I, I have, I, you know, it's, it's rare to find somebody that has such an encyclopedic knowledge of the field. Like, I think a lot of people are very specifically trained and they, they know how to dive deep into their discipline. But you have this you have this ability to overview in a really satisfying and comprehensive way. And you clearly spend a lot of time thinking about it. You spend a lot of time talking about it and writing about it. And so it's 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 been a, it's been a joy. And so I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah I'm so sorry for uh, having 
so many challenging things to say about some of your previous guests. Um, but that's the point uh, of the show, I, honestly. I mean, that's that's why we do this is we want to be able to have conversations about these topics where it's not just, you know, one audience listening to one perspective all the time. We want to be able to have different people uh, come on and really be able to get well, different I, perspectives. I appreciate so. you being willing to to listen to what I have to say. You know, I like to hope uh, that if someone comes along in the future and uh, you say, well, Ethan was here and he said this, that 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 person will be compelled to say, yeah, OK, look, that's true. I, because hopefully uh, the things I'm telling you do reflect what's accurately known to the best of our knowledge today. Um, and we will always, I hope, be learning more in the future. And hopefully some of the things that I've told you will have to be revised in the face of more and better knowledge. Uh, but hopefully that what I am telling you does bring you right up to the frontiers of what we know. Uh, and yeah. if you learn something different, tell me because I want to catch up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That's that's what's exactly valuable about what you're doing. I really appreciate your work. So thank you. Awesome. Well, I will keep doing it to the best of my ability. All right, man. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. You as well. See ya. Bye, everyone. Bye.